I'm trying to show people that you can actually make turns and control yourself and have a good time on these things. And one of the ways that I want to show that, and one of the things I want to do with that is set a new world speed record. Snow skating remains the only snow sport with a speed record of less than 100 miles an hour. Yeah, so I'm Harrison Bell. I live in Rocky Mountains in Colorado, and I've basically kind of pioneered like a new style of snow skating, um, which comes from taking longboarding and then applying those things to the snow. Yeah, so why don't we expand on that a little bit? Can you just tell us a little bit about how you got into longboarding and how how this evolved into snow skating, or maybe you did one before the other? Yeah, so when I first moved to Colorado, I moved to this little condo that's right next to a bus route that goes from the town of Frisco up to Copper Mountain. So right there, you have bus access to a rec path that does six miles downhill at a 6% grade, which is like a dream for a beginner longboarder. So I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I was into skating and I was into hills coming from North Carolina, not really having any experience skateboarding. So I just started riding the bus with my pool board and bombing that little rec path, you know, on some Indy 215s. And I think I had uh, Bones ATF Rough Riders. And on that bus, I met the guy who would like turn me into a longboarder, and that's Mike DeGrotto. So Mike DeGrotto is like a legendary street loser out here in Colorado, born and raised Frisco. And he does that path all the time. So he saw me and he was like, you need to get rogues or Ronins so you don't wobble. And I went home. I was like, all right, rogues or Ronins. Ronins were out of stock, obviously. So I got rogues and that was like the beginning of my longboarding career. Everyone locally saw that I had a set of rogues and they started showing me hills and trying to teach me how to slide. Things progressed rapidly from there. So I went into the winter thinking I'm going to be a snowboarder and I should preface this. The whole reason I moved to Colorado is because the guy who taught me how to skateboard as a child now lives in Breckenridge, Colorado. And that's Jimmy Leapart. And so he was a pro vert skater in the 70s and 80s. And he went on a team trip with PBR out to Breckenridge at one point. And like when his life fell apart back home, he decided Breckenridge is the coolest place I've ever been on my skateboard. So that's where I'm going to come back to. And then that was always in the back of my head. Like we got to chase Jimmy out to Breckenridge eventually. So me and my two older brothers did that. So I moved to Colorado, get into longboarding over the summer. And then that winter, Jimmy Leapart got me into snow skating. He rode four Hovland snow skates at the time. And he's one of the OG snow skaters in the area. So he actually let me borrow his snow skate for like three days straight. <laughs> I like stole it from him really. And I just kind of never looked at my snowboard again. I moved to Colorado with a full snowboard setup. Like I'm going to ride powder and jump cliffs. And then Jimmy let me borrow his snow skate. And I just never looked back. I was like, this feels like longboarding. This is what I want to do. It was a snow skate. It's the ones that I've seen have literally just their skateboard, skateboard deck essentially with, almost like a rubber bottom or like a smooth bottom. And, you know, you ride that downhill similar to you would with a, with a snowboard, right? Is that the version that you're riding at this point in time? No. So we're, so we're riding on the ski resort with bi-level snow skates. So in snow skating, there's really like three generations of snow skates. The first generation of snow skates were just flat decks with slick bottoms. Um, some of them had a little bit of like a raised contoured edge, like the Burton approach. Um, but really these were just made for screwing around in your backyard. And then at some point they made by levels where it's a skateboard on top of a little ski that's as long as the skateboard, really small. The first one was the Burton junkyard. 
And these were again, sold to be ridden in your backyard on little rails, no leashes. And it wasn't until like the late nineties or something, um, the side country became a thing. So people realized you could put a bigger ski on the bottom of a snow skate and ride this natural terrain because you weren't allowed to ride groomed ski resorts. So this is what I refer to as like the second generation of snow skates where you have now the bottom ski, which we call the sub deck is longer. It has a fatter nose. Typically it could be like a spoon shape or a lollipop shape. We call that. And these are sold with leashes. So they're made to be ridden at places like big hills, but they're not sold with the intention of riding at a ski resort with chairlift access or with groomed slopes. They were specifically made for powder for side country, slack country, or like backyard powder. And so that's the Florida powder skates. The Florida powder skates lives on today as Opala snow skates. They purchased the molds from Florida and they produce some of those old shapes under that company now. So you can still get those shapes. That was like the second generation of snow skating. And then in Breckenridge, we had this other thing happening where this guy Clayton Conway was basically taking full length powder skis and bolting them up to skateboards because he was breaking skis and he just found that there wasn't a long enough edge or enough edge grip in those powder skis to like safely land off of a jump. So this third generation of snow skating really comes from the desire to do big park and big jumps and have a solid long ski to land on. So that was all already going on by the time I came into things. And the first snow skate that I rode was like a Florida powder skates type snow skate. It was the Hovland buckshot. Yeah. And you're, you're saying that the type of riding that you're doing is, is kind of the next evolution of that. And, and maybe we can kind of give some context for the listeners of how, you know, how people ride these or approach these as, as they're going downhill. Cause you know, on a snowboard, you can really like, you know, leaf it down, really, really carve your board horizontal with the hill and slow down, you know, skis, you can kind of do the same thing, pizza, French fry, all that sort of things. But on a snow skate, you're just, you're, it seems suicidal, right? You're going down a Brocken Ridge mountain or whatever, and you just point that thing forward. How the hell do you slow down? So yeah, I mean, if you see a snow skater on the mountain, typically what you're going to see is something that's either like in the style of like a Burton junkyard, but bigger. So it has like a, maybe a wider, longer ski on the bottom, but a symmetrical short ski and a double kicktail top deck. Or you'll see guys riding the spoon shaped ski underneath again with a double kicktail top deck. And the way you ride these, you can't really side slip the whole hill like a snowboarder, like just stand on your feet and just it's really hard on the snow skate, but you can just like throw a million slashes. So think about like putting down the roughest road you've ever skated down and all you have are really tiny wheels and they're not soft. That's what snow skating is for most people. They're like, well, most people don't really go over 30, 35 on their snow skates because it's a death sentence because there's no dampening. The ski's extremely short. You're just going to get thrown off as soon as you hit any bumps. So when I saw these guys riding long skis to get away with landing huge jumps, it made me think like, well, wouldn't those be better to carve on or just generally riding down the mountain? If you have more edge to sink into the snow, you could trust it more. It would absorb bumps better. And so this is where I got into building long snow skates with the intention of riding them like long boards, I guess. 
And maybe we should give the listeners a little background on like slowing down, breaking all that stuff with the longboards. Um, in longboarding, you can either just kind of, you know, throw your board sideways, power slide down and, you know, break by essentially snow plowing, but on the road, it's terrifying. You got to get used to it. You got to, you know, know how to balance that friction. So you don't throw yourself into the pavement. Um, but a lot of people when they're learning, um, and just for safety, they have these gloves with urethane pucks on them. And when they're riding, they can actually touch the pavement and they can use that to kind of heel slide or, you know, toe slide. And it just gives them more points of contact for them to slide. Yep. So if you're watching the video, you can see it looks like just a normal glove and it's got this like cutting board disc on the, on the face of it. And that, that allows you to make contact with the pavement and, you know, maneuver your, your center of gravity, your body all around to make it easier to slide and safer to get down these hills. And, uh, one thing we noticed when we were watching your videos is you started doing that with snowboarding and, or not snowboarding, snow skating. So is that like a new evolution thing or, or what? I'd like to think so. Yeah. So in snow skating, pretty much people don't ever lean over far enough that you could touch the ground or they never squat that low on their snow skates. In snow skating, you're pretty much controlling your speed with stand up sliding like a free rider only. Um, the problem with carving on a snow skate is that because you have like two decks on top of each other, as you tip over on that steel edge on the bottom, you're going to reach a point where the top deck and your feet on it are going to drag in the slope. Uh, I call this decking out because in snowboarding, if you lean over so far that your boots drag in the ground and then you eat shit because you lose contact with your edge, they call that booting out. <clears throat> so in snow skating, it's possible to boot out with your shoes and it's possible to boot out with just the deck rail alone making contact. So what I discovered through just Instagram is that in Japan, they have a really unique hands down style where they use these gloves with a rubber surface on them. And this allows them to drag their hands in the snow on every turn and not lose any speed. So it just gives a really cool look to their style. But I saw that and realized if my gloves slid more, maybe I could actually do glove down turns on the snow like you would on a longboard. The problem is that you put your hand down in the snow, it grabs, and then you over rotate, and then you're, you're not in the carve anymore, you're sliding. So I started with the Sector 9 Ergo Pucks. Let me find those. And so this is an Arcteryx snow glove with a Sector 9 rounded puck glued onto it. This actually works really, really well when the snow is firm. So especially on like an icy morning or something where this kind of mitten can actually hurt. If you're dragging your hands in the snow and you dip your thumb into that corduroy and it grabs one of the ridges, you know, you feel everything and it kind of hurts. But with the puck on ice, it feels just like putting a puck down on pavement, except it glides completely perfectly. There's like no drag at all. And in the pre-call, we were talking about squalling. Is, is that something that, like, that's kind of how people carve without the gloves, right? Can you maybe explain what squalling is? I discovered squall through a local ski shop through this guy who I knew who serviced uh, my skis. At the time, I was riding for this company that produced a snow skate that was basically a custom ski with snowboard inserts. Um, the problem with riding a ski as your snow skate, skis are designed to have their pressure distrib distributed across two of them. So as soon as you put all your weight on one ski, it just feels like floppy and the thing's going to wash out from under you. <clears throat> And I thought, well, that's my dog upstairs. No worries. <laughs> I want to see if she'll chill out. 
And so skis are often made with like a ton of early rise in the nose and tail, which means that the part of the ski that makes you turn, which is the side cut, doesn't actually go to the tip and tail of the ski. So you have all this extra weight on the tip and tail that's really just meant for you to float on. And when you try to do these hard longboard carves on super firm snow, it just vibrates and shatters. <clears throat> but anyways, I discovered Squall from this local ski shop. This guy who was servicing my ski, he was like, hey, man, I've got this thing. It's been sitting in the shop for 10 years and no one knows what to do with it. Do you think you could make a snow skate out of it maybe? And I was like, I don't know. I took it home and it scared the crap out of me for like two years. I didn't build it as a snow skate. Let me grab it. I didn't know it at the time, but what the guy had given me is like a priceless gym in the squall community. This is the LaCroix contest squall 180 centimeter. It's made to be ridden with hard boot bindings, one foot in front of the other, like a slalom water ski. So in the 90s, guys used to ride these. And the way that it worked was basically your feet are straight up on top of each other, 90-90, like a water skier. Once you tip over on your edge, there's no way to like get yourself up and back onto the other edge. So you have to put your hand down and push off of the slope. So these guys in the 90s kind of perfected like the glove down turn on snow. So they had already figured it out and it looks like a longboard turn. But if you were to strap your feet to your longboard pointed straight forward and they do these turns by like, I saw one guy put Tupperware on the bottom of his gloves. So they would <laughs> slide or some other guys just use like really slick gloves. So I, once I had done some research and I saw like what these guys were doing with these in the nineties, then I realized, oh, this might be viable as a snow skate. It's just going to be really scary. My custom ski was like 130 centimeters effective edge and it had like an eight meter radius. This thing is 175 centimeters effective edge. So the turn radius goes all the way through the tip and tail and it has a 15 meter turn radius which is huge it's still the biggest squall ever produced the fastest and stiffest squall ever produced it rides like a straight up log like a giant piece of wood it's terrible <laughs> but i rode that for a minute and it really unlocked like the next level of snow skating for me that, that's super interesting. So you're actually riding with, with your feet parallel with the, with the ski. Um, well, actually, are you still riding that way when you strap the deck on top or does the squall board, the squall ski, just it being wider, having the larger turn radius, um, having the longer effective edge, does that make it so that you can't actually board out or boot out as you explained? Exactly. So you can think about like, there's a ratio there where, um, as your top deck gets wider and your bottom ski gets skinnier, you can't lean over as much, but as your bottom ski gets wider and your top deck gets skinnier, eventually you'd reach a point where if they were the same width, you'd have no leverage, but you'd be able to tip it over 90 degrees onto the slope, right? So dial that back a little bit. And if you ride like, this is a 115 millimeter wide squall. And if you put like a 125, 130 millimeter wide longboard on top, all of a sudden you can lean over past 45 degrees. You can lean to like 60 degrees, um, which is crazy. So all of a sudden you can turn so much harder than anyone in the history of snow skating has been able to turn because everyone's so afraid of riding skinny top decks and wide sub decks. 
the way so i'm an engineer by background mechanical engineer and the way you describe that is so perfect because if you had a if you rode on a snowboard i was always wondering why why don't people snow skate on snowboards with the the two decks or the double layer as you explained it because you have no leverage so you know you're you're like digging in so hard to tip over but and that's why you have to have a thinner bottom but as you said, it can't be too thin. Otherwise, you'll board out. That That is like the perfect way to explain it. Um, I think that kind of just like wrapped it up and put it all into perspective for me. And then so another thing that we're dealing with is comparable to the, the weighted boards thing coming out of Australia. So for anyone watching who's not like well-versed in longboard culture, in the last five years in longboarding, there's been a trend of riding really, really small boards with really big, really grippy wheels and putting a sledgehammer under your front foot. This basically has the effect of making your tiny board weigh as much as those big, huge boards used to weigh in like 2010. So it slides just as easily as those big boards used to slide. But now you have all the maneuverability of a tiny board under your feet. So in a similar way with snow skating, I wanted a way to ride a stiffer flex sub deck without feeling like you're just going to get bounced out of the snow every time you like flex it. So I discovered that by adding weight under your front foot, just like the Aussies do in the longboarding, you can have a snow skate that has a camber flex profile, like a snowboard, and it's pre-weighted to where it's almost decambered. So all you have to do as the rider is just give a little push on your back foot and decamber it into a skidded turn. Or you can just lean onto your front foot and that camber comes right back and then you're gripping on edge again. So my snow skate now weighs 18 pounds. <laughs> And so that's part of the other thing is, well, yeah, of course the long snow skating, no one's figured it out yet because you can't put like, you can't put no weight on this thing and then expect it to not flip under your feet. It has to be weighted. One thing to understand about snow skating is that the surface that you're riding is so much more bumpy than longboarding. It's bumpy, it's off camber, slope changes. It's not like skating a nice graded paved road. <laughs> yeah, and I, it almost seems like, like with snowboarding, everybody longs, or in skiing, everybody longs for a powder day. But I bet that you don't even like powder days. Like you want to go on the crappiest conditions where it's a sheet of ice so that you can just, you know, bomb that thing exactly. out, have a nice smooth surface to carve across. But even then, like, if it's not just not groomed, you have all these ruts and these little divots that, that can kind of buck you around if you're not used to it. This brings me to, like, my custom snow skate. So I've done a couple things to try to mitigate all the bumps and divots and everything. Um, so this thing, unfortunately, is out of commission because I melted a big old hole in it. <laughs> set it next to the fireplace and left it oh for no minutes yeah classic blunder but i was getting so pissed off because i just kept waxing it and i'd get the most perfect wax finish on it and then i'd go out on the slopes and it just ran like shit it just felt sticky under my feet and i have these runs that i know i've done like 60 65 on and I'm struggling to break 50 on this ski. And I'm like, why is it so slow? So one night I was all pissed off, just like getting it super hot, waxing it, setting it by the fire, waxing it again, setting it by the fire. And then I looked back and I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> but this thing's from the 90s and it has like no base left on it. So I was looking for someone to produce a new squall for me. In the Do they even make them anymore? They don't. So Squall has evolved since this thing was produced. The sort of racing scene for Squalls didn't really take off. So Squalls got wider 
and the approach became to ride them with ski poles instead of with slick gloves. So instead of doing glove down turns where you're completely laid out into the slope with your hand, you're kind of standing more upright, not leaning over as far, using ski poles. But this opens up powder riding and all this sort of other stuff. Like the modern squall, which is like the free squall, which they, they're saying is like a squall that you can do free skiing on, like powder. It would be too wide. You wouldn't be able to get leverage unless you were like a size 14 shoe size or something. And you had a super wide deck. So I did get in contact with Squall. And when I was doing all this stuff with retro Squalls, this girl, Katarina Hill, hit me up. She is one of the fastest girls on a longboard right now. Um, she's like winning stuff left and right out of Canada and she had been snow skating for a while was going to attend a race and asked me about the squall. So I pointed her for a few retro squalls. She actually ended up winning her first snow skate race she ever attended on that squall. And from what I was told, she smoked everybody and was waiting at the finish line. So I was so excited to hear that. But anyways, so when you the, is there anything worth worthwhile knowing about snow skate racing? Because I I imagine you can just come in with any form of snow skate as long as you're not binded in. Like if you come with something new like this fourth generation so of snow skate, I'm I am banned, or I was banned from the snow skate races because I use foot stops. This is actually a whole other thing. Basically, all of the snow skate culture and the in group that represents snow skating right now ousted me from all their Facebook groups and banned me from coming to any events. They told me if you come to this race, we're going to kick the shit out of you, you know, threatened violence on me and stuff all because I come from, it's a shortboard longboard thing. I'm a longboarder. They're shortboarders. So they see a foot stop as like cheating in a race. Or something like that. Um, it's all, you know, water under the bridge because the races that they put on are relatively lame and I'm not really interested. It's not much of a bragging, right? You know, when the top speed of your race is 30 miles an hour and it's decided in the first five seconds by the push. <laughs> oh man. That's so, so when, when this girl, <laughs> run or ran the wow won the so snow skate race she just won it without a foot stop but what's funny is the next year a different girl who actually learned to snow skate with way back in the day Laraline, larry she won with a foot stop and they let her podium and take pictures and everything so i don't think it was really about the foot stop right it was about me <laughs> And like what I represent. Snow skating without a foot stop is insane, by the way. It's like trying to go down the roughest paved road you've ever skated without a foot stop. Why would you do that to yourself? So I was looking for who could make me a custom carving squall that would also be good for speed. And I know this local company tonic snowboards they have a reputation for making the best carving and racing snowboards in the world and i see this guy who rides for them on the slopes all the time ryan napton he's like the most famous carving snowboarder and that's his thing he just does the most extreme carving you've ever seen on a snowboard he actually stopped me one day on the hill when i was riding this yellow squall and he was like Oh, is that a squall? That's awesome, man. You know, we used to be friends with Ace Squall. This guy, Christopher Chabot, who's the most famous squall rider in North America. And he said, yeah, yeah, that guy used to ride with Donick. Actually, we used to make his custom squalls before he started his own company, which is called Ace. That's his nickname. And so I was thinking like, oh, they already have mold. 
I could just hit them up. So we talked back and forth for a long time and we ended up making a version of his old squall. It's basically the ace squall, but it's a little bit skinnier and it has dampening construction. So Donic has what they call secret construction, which is basically like a version of their board that has a fuck ton of carbon stringers in it. And so now when you hit these bumps, these carbon stringers distribute the shock down the entire length of the board. And it's mm. so damp. It's the most plush damp. It's like riding wheels with cores after riding wheels with no cores. Is that, so that's all on your bottom board. Is there any, like, is there any technology or anything you need to worry about that on the top board? That's just like your, your weight that you were talking about. Um, like, like how do you think about the two decks and the technology between the two? So one problem that I saw in snow skating when I first started and that I always wanted to tackle the skis work because you're, you're mounted to the center of them. So when you flex a ski, it can banana totally on both sides of your foot. And there's only a little space under your boot where it's kind of like a dead zone in snowboarding. There's like a dead zone under your bindings. Maybe they've done a lot to sort of get rid of that. But then in between your legs, you can bring your knees closer together, or push your knees further apart and you can make that center of the board flex on a snow skate. If you're going to mount a ski to a skateboard on a 20 inch wheelbase, you've got 20 inches of ski that is completely dead. It's not going to flex like a snowboard because it's pinned on these two yep. points at 20 inches apart. So I, I always thought that was a huge problem. So when I first set up the thigh squall, the retro squall, I mounted it on this wheelbase, which is like 12 uh, inches. Everyone in snow skating thought I was fucking crazy for doing this. I was getting comments like, bro, how are you riding that wheelbase? And I was like, this thing is so stiff. It's like a log. If you try to mount it on this outside wheelbase, it's just not going to do much when you push into it. It's not going to flex. So I did that and I realized, oh, wow. You can get a lot more flex out of a very stiff ski just by running a short wheelbase. And then I started looking at other technologies in slalom snowboarding and I discovered isolation plates through Donic. So Donic being fucking pioneers of the snowboard carving world, they created back in the day, these plate systems where basically instead of mounting your binding straight to the snowboard, you mount a plate to the snowboard that has a fixed pivot on the rear and a sliding pivot on the front. Now, when the snowboard flexes, your binding mounts don't flex. They just slide on that forward sliding pivot and you get this little gap in between your binding plate and the center of the board as it flexes and comes away. And this was a huge advantage for racing because it allows racers to just stay in the same body position through the whole turn. Your knees aren't like your feet, your feet aren't doing this during the turn, lifting up like your toes are lifting up and your heels lifting up in the back. You don't have to compensate for anything. You can just drive power through the turn. And this also isolates you from a lot of the bumps that the board experiences because you're on this separate plate. So I spent a long time thinking about it and pretty much had a set of these designed and CNC machined for my snow skate. So now I have snow skate trucks that are a fixed pivot in the rear and a sliding pivot in the front. And that sliding pivot coupled with the dampening construction and the Donic, it just makes for like the smoothest ride ever. I mean, I call it a magic carpet because you just, it's so much smoother than a snowboard even 
on a snowboard, you're standing directly on the base and you're hitting directly all the bumps in the slope. But when you have a snow skate up on edge, it's kind of like a weird hydrofoil for the snow. You don't feel everything that the sub deck feels. I was thinking about that because I'm glad I asked that question because in, in an ideal deal world where you explained that you want kind of flex throughout the entire lower deck, you almost need like an accordion as the top deck. And the way you solved for that is by having a sliding, almost like a bracket. It, it locks into this, this V channel and it allows it to slide forward and backwards as you're, you're bending or flexing this board. And if I understand it correctly, now you don't have to move your feet around because the flex of the bottom kind of handles the, or your weight distribution affects the flex of the bottom deck. And it does, you know, everything you need to when you, Otherwise, we need to reposition your feet. Did I explain that correctly? Yeah, I, I guess I would say like before I had the sliding truck, it felt like you were either standing inside the trucks or outside of the trucks. There's always this dead zone in between the truck mounts. But when you when you stand completely inside both of those flex points, it feels like the ski is very stiff because it's being reinforced by the top deck. If you move those points in, like I did with the 12 inch wheelbase to where your feet are standing completely outside in the flex zone, it kind of feels like you're riding like two halves of a snow skate. If you put mm -hmm. a bunch of weight on your back foot, you can get that back to flex and do this big, heavy weight back foot skidded turn you make like a diving board can... on each end of your of your upper deck yeah it's not ideal so you're kind of like you have to be very very careful about your weight distribution but as soon as you create a system where the entire ski can flex freely like it's supposed to it feels like you're riding the whole ski and you just have that much more freedom to do whatever you want <laughs> Yeah, I'm locked wild. into like, am I standing in the right spot over my trucks? Is we've gone into so many, so much technology with all this that I'm just, I'm just choosing. It's a it's real like, rabbit hole. That's where I knew this podcast was going to be spaghetti because <laughs> it's also my brain, dude. Like I am the most harebrained dude you'll ever meet. Yeah. And you're, you're trying to. I bet you spend a lot of time just sitting down thinking through the, the science behind all this and try to, I mean, clearly you, you've been contacting these different companies to come up with unique things to try out and see what works and what doesn't. It's, it's just, it's crazy. I mean, is there any other technology that you would want to kind of ramble on before we go into like, you know, next steps or progression of the sport? Yeah. So like, uh, you know, I'm always working on that sort of s another aspect of uh, another aspect of snow skates that is overlooked is the tuning. And this was something that I had to research speed skiing to figure out what people were doing there. Speed skiing and speed snowboarding. So two connections that really helped me out there were. Um, JD prints with dynamic wax. Um, this guy is like the king. He is the uh, black sheep of the speed skiing world. In speed skiing, you have a culture that's dominated by legacy. And basically their rules are in place where you have to ski with poles. You have to ski with this type of wax. And there's just not much room for improvement. It's just the guys who are already the best, just improving little by little. This guy, JD Prince comes out of left field and he invents a new type of wax in Austria when he's a ski instructor, which basically comes from rain -X. back in the day. Rain X was banned in racing because people figured out you could just spray the base of your snowboard with rain -X. And it was fucking way faster than wax. And it doesn't care about what temperature the snow is. 
Um, so not to compare dynamic wax to rain X because dynamic wax is like a proprietary thing. That's exactly made for this, but basically JD took that concept and took it to the absolute max. He got in touch with these Chinese manufacturers who make nanoparticle solutions and he developed like the world-class nanoparticle wax. So he taught me about base tuning. You can tune your base by basically changing the type of grooves that you put in the base when you get it ground at a ski shop. So if you've ever been to a ski shop, you'll see these like big drums that's got a stone wheel on it. And then you run the ski over this stone wheel. It's a stone grinder. And this grinder puts grooves down the length of your ski. That kind of helps your ski track straight down the hill. Well, what you don't know is that the steel edges of your ski are actually lifted up just a tiny bit. So we call this base edge bevel. And then you have side edge as well. So your base edge can be zero, one, or two. All rental skis, all consumer level skis are going to have a base edge bevel of one. Because when you put a base edge bevel zero, it causes you to catch your edge because that edge is in the snow. Anytime your board is at level with the slope, your edges are in the snow. But in speed skiing world, a lot of people run a zero degree base edge bevel because it gives you control over your steering when your base is completely flat. And in snow skating, it allows you to overcome the thing that snowboarders do that we can't do, which is we cannot twist the ski. So in snowboarding, when you're coming out of a turn, like say you're on a toe side turn, you're turning up the slope, you're going across the slope on your toe side edge and you want to switch to your heel side edge. What you actually do on a snowboard is you rock your front foot over first and then your back foot. So while the board is changing edges, it's actually twisting. The front edge makes contact first, and then the whole board is on the other edge, and then it tips over. In snow skating, the whole thing is torsionally stiff, so you, and you have no control over the twist. So you're just riding that toe side edge until it flops over and it catches on that heel side edge. So sometimes if you have a little bit of angle on that base edge, when you're like coming off of one edge and going to the other, there's a moment where you just have no contact with anything. You're just riding on the plastic base of your ski. It's terrifying. As soon as you put a zero degree base edge bevel on it, you're just always in contact and it doesn't have that problem. Hmm. So thank you, JD Prince, because without those two things, which are getting a deep groove tune on your base, which is also like a spring tune. So you have really deep channels that really kind of straighten the thing out. And then the edges have to be flush with the base. You don't want them lifted up at all. And if you just take your skis to a shop and tell them to wax them, they will give you a one degree base edge bevel. So that was really good knowledge to have. Um, JD helped me a lot in the beginning. Who else was I going to say was like a key figure in the beginning? Mm. What were you talking about just before? <laughs> oh, I just asked you if there's any other like technical stuff with, with how you've designed your, your snow skate to get to where you are. Like you went into so much different technical stuff about it. And even, yeah. even the base tuning, I think that's fascinating. This is all stuff I did not know about about the sport and like you're starting from scratch, you're combining skiing and snowboarding and longboarding all into this like hodgepodge Frankenstein of a, of a thing. So I didn't know if there's anything you wanted to cover before we moved on to like progression of the sport. Yeah. That pretty much catches us up to speed. Do you, so there is, you go to a ski hill and you never see snow skaters. Like I, I feel like it's, it's such a small, tiny community that 
everyone's afraid of like you know people feel comfortable strapped into their their snowboards or their skis so i mean you seem surprised that no one's thought of some of this technology but it seems like it's i don't know it seems like everything that you're doing is kind of paving paving the way for how to think about this stuff to make it safer um and more comfortable for people to ride on which you know maybe that that presents the opportunity for more people to get in involved into this and, and like actually take on snow skating and see it more out in the wild. Like, how do you feel? Yeah. Does that seem accurate? Yeah, I, that's exactly how I feel about it. I feel like all of this stuff taking, getting away from custom skis and custom mini snowboards and just riding squalls on snow skates is a huge step forward. Um, riding it in a longboard style where you have the ability to grab rail and put a glove on the ground allows you to stop safely in a way that other snow skaters just can't. People tell me like, oh, I can, you know, like people are actually baffled by my glove down slides and turns. It doesn't make sense. Snow skaters tell me that they can't reach the ground on heel sides. Like as soon as you lean over far enough that you would be in a body position where you could touch your hand on the ground, you're already sliding and then you're just standing up sliding. Hmm. So I think we've really like pushed it to a new place where you can actually start to play around with these things. And is that, is that kind of where you see this going or is there, is there more to it? Do you see this kind of changing the snow skate racing scene, the, you know, the type of, you know, seeing more snow skates out in the wild, uh, like, like what else do you see for this, this progression? So, yeah, I mean, my official take on this is that snow skating still is, and maybe always will be just too difficult, right? Like you have to have experience as a longboarder and a snowboarder to really have a good shot at being a good snow skater. I've had friends who went from skateboarding directly into snow skating with no snowboard experience and vice versa, you know, from snowboarding directly into snow skating with no longboarding experience. And it just doesn't, number one, it's hard to learn that way. And number two, it just doesn't have that appeal for you. If you're not already a longboard or snowboarder, it's a fusion sport. So I think it's not very appealing. Um, but yeah, my official take is that I don't care. I don't want more people to start snow skating. If more people start snow skating and get hurt or let their skates fly down the mountain off leash, that's just bad news. So <laughs> my real goal in all of this is to set a new world speed record and put snow skating in a new category for snow sports. Right now, snow skating is kind of seen as like, like how you were describing it. It's scary. It's not approachable. You see other snow skaters and you see that they're kind of struggling to get down the hill and it doesn't really work that good. I'm trying to show people that, you can actually make turns and control yourself and have a good time on these things. And one of the ways that I want to show that and one of the things I want to do with that is set a new world speed record. Snow skating remains the only snow sport with a speed record of less than a hundred miles an hour. Can you guess the top speed for blind skiing? Oh my gosh. Uh, 115. It's exactly 100. So that's okay. the lower limit. One legged skiing, 130 <laughs> 100... miles an hour. My gosh. So if you can fly down the hill on one leg on one ski at 130 miles an hour, there's simply no reason we can't do 100 on a snow skate. So this is like really what got me into snow skating in the very beginning was I looked at the Guinness World Records archives and I realized the world record speed for snow skating is 42 miles an hour. <laughs> Everyone does that. Like I do that every time I snow skate. So 
why is it that uh, to this point people have been either too afraid or there's just been no interest? I don't know. I just happened to comment like the crux of like where I live, Breckenridge specifically has a rich speed skiing history. We are home to the first speed skier to go 130 miles an hour, CJ Mueller. He kind of blew up speed skiing as a sport in the nineties. It was really just like a Colorado and Europe thing. And then when they did their Olympic demonstration event in 1992, and he set the new record of 130, that really changed speed skiing. So I'm, I'm coming into it with the legacy of speed skiing, the legacy of squall carving, the legacy and history of longboarding on big mountain passes in the area. So I'm just like scratching my head, like how has no one put this all together? This is so much fun. And every time I ride it, I'm like, I know I'm having so much more fun than everyone else on the slopes. I, I think there's, there's some testament to longboarding too. I mean, longboarding is still super niche, super small, but it's kind of, it's kind of blowing up as the technology of the boards evolve, the slide gloves, um, you know, the internet, you know, I think people are making it more popular. Um, it, it seems like with snow, people have kind of conquered quote unquote, you know, the, the mountain with skis and snowboards. And so, yeah, as you said, as you make this like form of riding safer, um, it has the potential to grow a little bit and, and like kind of gain traction, which I know you're, you're not too concerned about, but it, it just seems like, it seems like the, the issue, how do we approach snow and slopes has been solved. And so, it hasn't gotten the attention. Whereas longboarding, you know, they had to figure out how to make downhill skateboarding safe. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just like drawing parallels about. to these. No. And that's exactly what inspired all of this was before there, there wasn't a direct way to do longboarding on snow before mm -hmm. because longboards were big and bulky. And if you tried to put a longboard on one of those big bulky skis like those guys were riding in the park in 2010 it just wouldn't it wouldn't turn that good you'd just be riding a giant boat down the hill slipping around doing skidded turns so really what enabled this was slalom skateboard technology hitting the downhill scene C kind of made me realize oh you could make a slalom snow skate that's not like any snow skate that's ever existed. It could be like a slalom race longboard on top of a slalom race squall. And you'd be in new territory. But yeah, I think cause like I'm just a person who happened to fall into the mix at the exact right time and space and it just happened to be like everything's getting skinnier. I was like, man, they're finally getting skinny enough. I think you can just mount them. The other thing that happened was wheelbases got shorter. So it used to be to make this full circle. We should really talk about bumpy Hale's new pro model from rocket longboards. So bumpy made this board with rocket that he is calling a snowboard. It uses camber under the front foot, which is like having a canted foot stance, which is something that they've done in squall since the nineties. Basically you would put risers under your heels to lift the heels of both of your feet to give you this really aggressive forward stance. Yeah, one thing that really like enabled this new style of snow skating for me was the short wheelbases on longboards. It, it was such a struggle for me going from longboarding in the summer on a big longboard to snow skating a really tiny thing and then going back and forth. 
I had to drill holes in all my decks and all these weird places. It was terrible. As the slalom downhill skateboards are getting smaller, they're approaching the exact same specifications of slalom snowboard racing with their foot positions. So in slalom racing, you have a stance, which is defined by the distance between like big toe to big toe or heel to heel or wherever you want to draw that line, you know? So a typical stance in slalom might be like 48 centimeters is my stance. I'm five foot 11. I was doing the math and I pretty much realized that 48 centimeters on a modern race board that's an 18 inch wheelbase your your feet go straight on top of where they would go on a squall so now you can just bolt everything up straight up you don't even have to think about how far forward is my board on top of the ski is it too far forward too far back is my wheelbase too long too short it's like all the industry standards are converging, <laughs> if that makes sense. All the physics are coming together and, and the most efficient design is coming out. Because we're really doing the same thing, which is slaloming on edge pressure, whether it comes mm -hmm. from wheels or it comes from snow or it comes from water. You're just slaloming and using the edge pressure of the thing under your feet. So it really should all be pretty similar. That's fascinating. Um, I always try to leave time at the end of the episode for people to kind of tell stories. We, we covered a lot here. So if is there any like stories that come to mind that are, are particularly interesting or funny with your snow skating adventures or longboarding? Um, not really. It's just like... I've I kind of developed this funny reputation as like an honorary 70 mile an hour club member because I'm so gnarly on the snow skate and I have done 70 people have this like expectation for my level on pavement and it's just not there. <laughs> <laughs> so I have like, I have a bunch of stories of me skating spots way outside of my comfort zone, sweating bullets, shitting bricks, barely coming out alive. <laughs> I'm like threading the needle between being a complete kook and being like a valid downhill longboarder. Just real quick. Like I assume you still feel much more scared of the pavement when you're doing this downhill stuff. Like how, how is falling on a snow skate at those speeds? Is it, is it still, is it pretty forgiving? Can you always pop back up or I don't know. It seems like a dumb question. I've always said it's like, it's like longboarding in a foam pit. Okay. Or, I like that. Or it's like video game longboarding where you just fall and just hit respond and nothing happens to you. It's amazing. <laughs> I've, I've fallen going 45 miles an hour onto my ass and your pants just get a little hot. You can do these amazing recoveries too. If you fall, like if you shoot the board out in front of you and you're sliding on your ass and you grab the leash and yank it towards you and dig your foot into the slope, you can do this like running jump back onto the snow skate at speed. It's so funny. And so you'll just be doing a heel side turn, you'll low side and be on your ass and then be like running and jumping back on the skate all in one fluid motion. And when you get oh, that under badass. the chairlift, it's so funny. That's like, badass. Your ability to kind of recover and get away with shit is amazing on a snow skate. You can tip all the way over to where your feet are dragging in the snow and like recover it. I've been practicing these turns that are called double decker turns where you dig the top deck in the snow as you're making the turn and it leaves two tracks in the snow. <laughs> From what I understand, I'm the only person in the snow skate world who can do these like for fun on command. Usually when it happens, it's an accident and it causes you to fall. But I figured out that if you have enough ski underneath, you can really dig in that top deck and it's still 
pretty much resting on the ski underneath, so it doesn't matter. Man, this this conversation went in a completely different direction than I expected. I, uh, I, I know. I mean, this is my fault for being so unstructured. No, no, I'm saying that in a good way. Like, I'm really happy we we got super nerdy about all the technicals of this because you, I don't know, you you did a very great job at articulating like the evolution of of honestly like board sports. I mean, you, you we know that snowboards and skis have gone through these iterations, and there's reasons they made all these changes. But you gave enough of a history and the context of why they were designed in certain ways, and how you've tried to apply that and iterate that into your snow skating. And I just I really enjoyed this. I had a great time talking about this, Harrison. Yeah, yeah so it's like I'm all part of a greater vision for me. I'm like, it's it's all just a continuation. I had no idea I'd still be doing this seven years later. But when I first picked up the snow skate, I was like, man, this is already so much more fun than snowboarding to me. And it doesn't even do 5% of what it could do, you know? Hmm. Like we're, we haven't even scratched the surface. So I feel incredibly lucky to have found a thing that somehow is like my thing that is untouched and there's so much room for progression and technology here. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, so you already gave a ton of shout outs throughout this episode. Is there any others that you'd like to give out? Yeah. Yeah. Shout out Patrick Balmain. He's the inventor of Squall. And this kind of blows my mind. Like, I, you know, it's a big place we live in. There's 7 billion people on this planet. How could it be that this guy invented a sport that only like 100 people ever got into? And he's still around, still doing it, still pushing it to new generations. Like, he's the man. So, yeah, Patrick Balmain, Thias Squall he's like, you know, enabled this whole thing to exist basically without him and the squall stuff that he pioneered in the nineties, we would have no direction forward. That's great. And, uh, before we shut this down, like where can people find you? Uh, find me on Instagram at bell Harrison, or I'm on YouTube. I'm like, We'll link to it in the show notes. Harrison so Bell on YouTube. Yeah, there's some okay. stuff on there. It's not much, but mostly Instagram. TikTok, Harrison underscore snow skates. Yeah, we'll, we'll put all this in there. I highly recommend you check this guy out because, you know, if you're at all interested in everything we talked about, it's it's much different when you see it in person. It's it's like a, you know, much very unique riding style and you can't really fathom it or figure it out until you kind of take a glance at it. Um, Harrison, thank you so much for coming on. This is a blast. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the type two fun podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a follow and feel free to reach out to say hello, give feedback or share your type two fun story.